Welcome to our online service. It's a new month, which means our latest newsletter, the Hatfield e-link, is out. Check your email inbox if you're a part of our mailing list or head to our website to find out more. If this is your first time tuning in, you can find out more about who we are, what we believe, and how we live it out by sending an email to hello at hatfield.co.za. We look forward to hearing from you. We celebrated our risen king a week ago. What were some of your highlights? Let us know on the live chat or by tagging us on social media. For now, stay tuned as we cross live to our service, which has just started. Happy Sunday. Weekend. What a beautiful weekend we had last week. And um, imagining what it must have been like for the disciples in that week preceding Easter Sunday, the great joy that they must have been feeling. Everything, their, their hopes have been scuppered uh, at the crucifixion of their Lord and Savior. And then suddenly, Jesus is alive. What that must have been like and what their response of their heart would have been like. We read, we read a little bit of that in John 20 verse 19. It says the following, the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. I love the way that Eugene, Eugene Peterson in his paraphrase, the message says it. The disciples seeing the master with their own eyes were awestruck, awestruck. They were like, oh, I can't believe this is true. You're here, Jesus. I wonder if I was to ask you, what is the best news that you could receive right now? Perhaps it's uh, some hopeless situation you think can't be resolved and suddenly you get a phone call and says it's been fixed or perhaps it's a, a interview you went for and you've been waiting and waiting for this phone call and they say yes you got the job or it's some a restoration of a relationship or what is that good news all of those pale in insignificance to the good news that Jesus is alive he is alive and here with us this morning by his Holy Spirit. And so as we enter into worship this morning, I thank you, Lord, for the good news that you died on a cross for our sins, but that you resurrected and that you're alive. You ascended to sit at the right hand of the Father to intercede and to pray for us and, to, and, and then you sent your Holy Spirit to come be with us, in us as temples of your Holy Spirit I pray this morning that we would worship as the early disciples did, did awestruck, awestruck, overjoyed because you are alive thank you Jesus, amen Good morning, church. You're welcome to stand with us as we worship the Lord, our King, our Savior, our God.
cost you rain, praise cost you rose and defeated the grave. I praise cost you faithful, praise cost you true, praise cost there's nobody greater than you. I praise cost you sought, praise cost you rain, praise cost you rose and defeated the grave. I praise cost you faithful, praise cost you true, praise cost there's nobody greater. Than Praise cause you saw, praise cause you reign, praise cause you rose and defeated the grave. I praise cause you're faithful, praise cause you're true, praise cause there's nobody. I'll praise. Yes, I'll praise cause you saw, praise cause you reign, praise cause you rose and defeated the grave. I praise cause you're faithful, praise cause you're true, praise cause there's nobody greater. Focusing on your breath, just how you breathe. Being conscious that this is the gift of God to you today. This is the gift of life that He's given us. And so this morning, Lord, we breathe you in. We breathe in your presence like we breathe in the air around us. We need you, God. Come and fill us. We breathe you in, Lord. And we say, God, we long for you.
to stay in, in worship and our pose and our posture at the moment as have a release a word from Tia. Morning family. When Luke said just now, worship and praise is a response to the revelation of who God is. There's the scripture 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And maybe you find yourself in a place this morning where you go, I cannot rejoice and I cannot pray and I cannot give thanks. But the Lord reminded me of this little animal called a prairie dog. And these little animals are so amazing that God has given them the natural ability to wahoo. <laughs> and so in their social circles with people, when they are pets or to each other, when they see each other, they go, wahoo. It's the cutest thing ever. And you know what? We can do that with the Lord. He delights in us. His joy is our strength. He is the one that gives us the spirit to be able to pray, to be able to give thanks, and to be able to rejoice. So this morning, if you find yourself in that space, ask Him for a revelation of who He is so that you can respond to Him. And even if you are in a place where you can pray, rejoice, and thank Him, ask Him for another revelation of who He is so that you can keep going, woohoo! Because you can praise Him and you can thank Him and you can worship Him. <laughs> I was so busy worshipping and keeping my my hand on the place that I okay there I've got it back while we were worshipping and um, Luke started speaking about breathing I just saw a picture of when my children were born and I was reminded of how how I waited in anticipation of them to take their first breath and it's like you hold your breath and you want to you want to hear them taking their first breath and them screaming that first scream and just that thankfulness when you hear them taking their first scream <laughs> and just that praise the lord and and i know that 
people all over the world, whether they are saved or not, at that moment, they say, thank you, God. Everybody knows there's a God, but they don't mention Him until something like that happens. It's extraordinary. So it's, it's just so amazing that He is the air we breathe. In Job 33 verse 4, it says, The Spirit of God has made me. The breath of the Almighty gives me life. And just imagine that that first breath your baby takes when they're born or that you took when you were born. It is the Spirit of God already there with you. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that absolutely amazing? Every one of you sitting here. <laughs> the first breath you took was the Spirit of God giving you that breath. I, that's absolutely amazing for me. Thank you, Ben. Can we respond to that as we sing one little song? And, uh, if you can stand, we worship one more song and then we'll go into the rest of the service.
desires to fall more in love with you, to become like you. We love you, Jesus. We love being with you. We love being part of your story, the good news that you are alive and that you're returning to make all things right. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Pray that it will become real to us, increasingly real to us as your children. Amen. Amen. We're going to take up our morning offering now. Um, I don't know about you, but I spend quite a lot of time preoccupied with worry about money. Uh, uh, maybe in your own life, or maybe, you, maybe I, certainly for me, but maybe you relate it becomes sometimes a bit of a preoccupation worrying about money. But recently I taught in our financial discipleship course and I was reminded again so clearly of the Lord Jesus speaking to us in Luke 16 verse 13 where he says, No one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one and love the other or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. I was really challenged by that in my own journey, and perhaps for you this morning, the same for you. Um, and one of the ways that we uh, fix those misaligned devotions is through our giving. Uh, it releases the hold that money has over our lives, the worry that we place in money and things. In the same way that perhaps prayer helps us with our control issues, we release things to God in prayer, or perhaps through fasting, through uh, our bodily desires, we fast to control those things. Perhaps giving is one way that we, we align, we, we re return those misaligned devotions and we come back to God with our, with our finances. And so I want to pray for us as we, as we give, as you, perhaps you have given already and you're going to give this morning, but Lord... As we've worshiped this morning, we want to be fully devoted to you. And as we give this morning, I ask that you'll help us to release our misaligned devotion for money so that we can fully worship you. As we do so this morning, help us, Lord. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your gentleness and your invitation. In Jesus' precious name. And everybody said, Amen. As always, a number of ways that you can give up on the screen, but you also can pass the baskets and as you give. So bless you as you do so. Thank you. Uh, as always, uh, we uh, have a Connect Lounge. And uh, our Connect Lounge is a place where if you're new here for the very first time, or perhaps you've been coming here for a while, actually I was sitting up in my office in preparation for this morning, and I actually sense there were some people here are a bit of an indecision at the moment. I feel the Lord say, maybe it's time to connect to this local body. Maybe the Lord's been challenging you, and I would love to meet with you to explain perhaps how you can make that happen. And uh, I'll share a little bit of thought with our team over a cup of coffee. And so that happens straight after the service where you may ask, if you go through the back doors on your left-hand side, it's called the Connect Lounge, and myself and some of our volunteers will be there to assist you. So please join in me. Join me for that. I'd really love to do that. There are no normal video announcements this morning, but I've got a couple of things I want just to communicate. First of all, just some opportunities to pray, and uh, we really do believe that prayer is important for us as believers. And so a couple of important places or opportunities for us to pray, the one is on Sunday mornings from half past nine to 10 o'clock, just before the service in our prayer room uh, on your left-hand side behind the doors over there. It's our elder-led prayer, Pastor Char uh, uh, Gerard, uh, the chairman of our eldership. He leads that, and so that happens from half past nine to 10 o'clock every single morning, Sunday morning, <laughs> not every morning. <laughs> 
Then on Wednesday evenings, we have online prayer from half past seven to half past eight. It's a time for us to meet online and pray, so you really are welcome to join us for that. We also, once a month on a Wednesday, we have our worship and prayer evenings. It's in our minor auditorium, also at half past seven, and so it's the last Sunday of every month. Then also, we have a healing room. And so if you are trusting the Lord for healing, please come join us at quarter to nine in our foyer hall. As you come into the church, you'll see it on your right-hand side. And if you want to want pray for, for healing, and please come join us. We have a team there with some of our pastors as well. Really important just to come and uh, do, receive uh, ongoing prayer in those spaces. You're really welcome to do so. And then also, just to say, just to watch this space, uh, we are uh, obviously as a nation gearing up for elections next month. Can you believe it's next month? already May, nearly midway through the year. And so we really felt as a, as a leadership to change focus in all our prayer initiatives as staff and as a, as a church. And uh, we want to pray for our nation. Uh, we want to intercede. We want to do spiritual warfare for our nation. So there's a whole bunch of initiatives that are happening already or that are going to start happening in May. We want to make May a, a, the month of prayer for our nation. And so you can already start praying already, uh, but watch this space. We'll communicate some more details in a short while. And then also just some opportunities to volunteer. Uh, one of the, the, the key decisions I made, the key things that helped me accelerate in my discipleship journey with the Lord was very early on, nearly 30, well, nearly 30 years ago, I got saved nearly 30 years ago in this church, uh, one of the first things I did was volunteer. And I used to pack chairs after youth meetings on Sunday, or on Friday evenings or on Sunday. And uh, it was one of those things that really helped me to connect to this body. Uh, it actually held me accountable. I built relationships. And really is a key way that we can grow in our disciple journey and, and be connected to the body. And so there's a whole bunch of ways you can connect here in volunteering at Hatfield Christian Church. And so I want to invite you, uh, if you, if there's something stirring in your heart about volunteering, being part of the body here, getting involved, please, uh, would you join us? You can drop an email to Mary, and her email address is volunteer at hatfield.co.za, volunteer at uh, hatfield.co.za. Mary will help you get connected. But we have three specific areas where we really need actually some help in volunteering. And the first one is in our children's ministry, uh, helping with our children. The second is in our communion team. And the lastly, in our worship family. Um, uh, not air guitar like me, or air drums, uh, but real musicians. Hey, Luke. Uh, but we'd love for you to, to get involved. If you have a musical ability, have a heart to worship the Lord, we'd love for you to be involved in one of those three places. And so you can email Mary at volunteer at hatfield.ca.za. Uh, but before I hand over to Pastor Louis to share the word with us this morning, we can watch a short video clip, and then we'll hand over to Pastor Louis. Thanks, everybody. Ever wanted to serve in the music, media, and arts ministry? Well, now is the time. Whether you're into cameras, lights, sound, or making music with your voice or instrument, we're looking for you. We need you. Our music, media, and arts team has many opportunities available for you to take up. So why would you volunteer to be a part of this ministry? I would say very much because God has placed a calling inside of you to serve him and to serve his people through the gift of music and media and the arts. And if God has placed that calling on you and inside of you, I would strongly suggest answer the call. Sign up today via our website homepage at hatfield.co.za and head to the volunteer tab, or you can send an email to volunteer at hatfield.co.za. Morning, family. How's everybody doing? Enjoying the rain that we've had? It's been wonderful. Moving over into autumn now and uh, all the good things with that. Today, uh, I want to share a message which is a little bit of a, as we call it, a standalone message. And we're having finished with our series in Hebrews. And on the 21st, we'll only be starting with our new series for the term. So this week, I will be sharing a message. And next week, I'm actually in Cape Town. And uh, Pastor Letzola will be with us. It'll be so great to have him here with us. And uh, please encourage him and just be very excited to see him. Uh, with the church plant, it's always a bit of hard work. So I think he's feeling it at the moment. So, you know, just laugh at everything he says. Clap hands. Just make him feel really good. Okay. Um, it'll, yeah, it'll just be wonderful to have him with us. So the message I want to share with, with you today is uh, I've entitled it simply A Better Tomorrow. 
Recently, in an article published by the Institute for Security Studies here in South Africa, they said the following. It is now undeniable. The crisis of leadership in South African politics, academia, business, and civil, and civil society is a failure we should shoulder collectively as a nation. It requires courageous reflection and action. Disappointed, betrayed, hopeless, angry, and fearful are some words that describe the current mood as South Africa nears 30 years of democracy. In this winter of discontent, the country needs leaders at all levels and sectors who are self-aware, unencumbered by ego, willing to admit mistakes, and can act in the interests of those they serve. Spusi Gordi said the following, what you do today has to reflect the society you want tomorrow. If the vision is for a safe, prosperous, and inclusive nation, we need to embrace a kind of leadership that listens, reflects, and does not perceive itself as superior to those it serves. I think you'll agree with me that in general, the experience of South Africans generally are that life and those that live in South Africa is life is challenging. Life certainly has some difficult bits to it. Whether you speak to the person that has to get up three o'clock in the morning to catch a train, a bus, a taxi, to get to their place of employment, and then spend about almost half their monthly income on transport, and then for the rest have to look after their family. Whether you speak to the single mom that has to have two jobs and then raise children and get them through school and all the challenges that that presents. Whether you speak to the unemployed person that tries every day to get 50 or 100 rand somewhere so that they can just get something to eat. Whether you speak to the young person that with a degree in their hand is walking around going for job application after job application only to be turned away and told that we need somebody with experience or we just don't have a position for you and your, your degree, perhaps you should study some more, your degree isn't going to be enough. Whether you speak to the CEO that has to work 60 hours a week to, in a very difficult environment, keep their company going to provide for its employees and can't remember when last he had a meal with his family and was just able to relax with them. Whether you speak to the middle manager and she will tell you that she's now doing the work of three people because through the last round of retrenchments they've just reduced the size of the company in terms of the workforce, but still expect the same outcome. And so on and so on and so on. And, and these things I reference because these are the real stories that you hear from people living in this country. People that have come here in the hope of a better life. Those that are working long hours and try and send money home, whether it's to some country in Africa or some country in Asia and every month they try and send money home to help their family. I think we will all agree that life seems to be a little hard at the moment. Now what are we going to do about it? What is the hope that we have for our nation and particularly as we think of this year and as Ben said we have elections coming up and our minds will turn to thinking about the leaders we need for this nation. Who are we going to vote for? Who are we going to elect? And where's our hope going to come from in terms of leaders that will actually help us to move in the direction of the potential and the possibility that this amazing nation has? We have such riches of resources. We have such amazing people, such caring and warm and creative people. Who's going to, what, where are we going to find the leaders? That will take us to a better tomorrow. And in trying to address that question or thinking about that question, I, I want to propose something. And what I want to propose is simply this. That perhaps we can't wait for the leaders that will lead us to a better tomorrow. But perhaps we should take up the leadership and begin to lead. And take the responsibility to build a better tomorrow for this nation and the people we love. 
Lolly Daskal, the leadership coach, says, leadership is not only for a few people. Leadership is for everyone and anyone who wants to lead. And I, I firmly believe that. That yes, it is very useful and it is right that we have people that are in positions where they are, have the, the, the responsibility to lead. But I want to say that that doesn't mean that leadership is only for those people. In fact, we all have to take up leadership. I mean, at least we have to lead ourselves, don't we? At least we have to, at some to time to time, say to ourselves, no, I'm not going to sleep late even though it's raining. I am going to church. And that's not a slight on anybody watching the service from the, from the warmth of their bed. Anybody joining us on live stream, you're so welcome. But even you, even you had to say, I'm not going to sleep. I'm going to do something now. And we have to lead ourselves, don't we? So at least that exists. But I think we can do more than that. I think this is a time in our nation and in this world where we need more people to say, I'm going to lead. I'm going to take up leadership. Simon Sinek, the leadership speaker, says, leadership is not about being in charge. Leadership is about taking char care of those in your charge. Leadership is not about being in charge. Leadership is about taking care of those in your charge. And I think that's the kernel of where leadership begins. It's about being a, a person that is willing to say, I want to make the world and life better for those around me. I'm going to do something to build a better tomorrow. Sometimes we think leadership is all about having the position, being in charge, being the person that has the say, being the person that everybody looks to or focuses on. But let me tell you, that's not really what leadership is about. Leadership is really about caring for people. It's really about putting your hand up and saying, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put some effort in. And I, I'm going to take the responsibility. I'm going to take the risk. And I, I'm going to give of my time, my energy, to help make life better for those around me. I mean, didn't Jesus say in Mark 10, in verse 44, he said, if you wanted to be the greatest then learn to be the servant of all. Leadership is not about greatness. It's about serving. It's about being the first to arrive and the last to leave sometimes. It's about being the person that can be counted on, that can be dependent on. It's about being the person that says, if nobody else does it, I'm going to do it. It's about having a capacity of heart. I love the fact that and we sometimes miss that little word in that quote of Jesus where he said, if you want to be the leader or the greatest, you must learn to be the servant of all. You see, sometimes we think serving means I serve the people that I think is worthy of me serving. Or the people that are like me or the people that I think is important. But Jesus says it's a lifestyle. It's a way of living. You begin to serve everybody that you can. And that's what we want. We want a spirit of leadership in our nation where, where we say, I'm going to care about everybody I come across. Not just the, thing, the people that I think deserves my care or the people that I think is important enough or the people that can do something, but everybody. Everybody. And that's the spirit of leadership. It's about taking care of those in your charge. Zig Ziglar said, you don't have to be great to start, but you have to start to be great. You have to some, sign up somewhere. You have to arrive somewhere and say, I'm going to make a difference. Things are going to be better because of me. I grew up in the context of great leadership. My dad had certain challenges in his life. He had a substance abuse problem. He had a gambling problem. And this is really just because of circumstances and bad things that happened in his life. But for that reason, he just wasn't able to take charge and lead in certain situations. But somebody else took, stood up and took leadership. And that was my mom. My mom said, just because somebody else is not doing what they're supposed to do, doesn't mean I can't 
step into that space. And she took up leadership. She taught my brother and myself how to honor my dad, how to respect him. She was the one that would make sure that we would go to church and she would drive us around. She was the one that kept us going. Even when my dad died at the age, when I was 17, my brother was 14. She, she's the one that kept everything going. She showed leadership. She said, I'm going to make sure that my children have a better tomorrow. And she couldn't do it in her own strength. She absolutely relied on the Lord and on this community to do it. But it required somebody to say, I'll sign up. I'm going to take responsibility even for that which is somebody else should have. I'm, if they're not doing it, I'm going to do it. And so perhaps as a, as a nation, we can't afford to spend all our energy on talking about what our people aren't doing. But rather be the people that says, what can I do? How can I change things? Now, I can't change the whole nation. But I believe God has placed me and you somewhere where we can do something. Whether that's being a parent, whether that's being a citizen, whether that's being a student, whatever. God has placed us. And by His Spirit, we can see something develop of a better tomorrow. Just a few more thoughts around this. Leadership is not about having position, a position of greatness. It is about doing great things from whatever position you are in. Sometimes we wait and we say, if somebody will only recognize and put their hand on me and give me the position... And that's great when that happens and that's, there's something powerful in that. But can I tell you, we all are in a position where we can do something great. We, we can all, in whatever space we find ourselves, say, I'm going to do something to make this better. I'm going to change something and make it better, whether that's your workplace. So what can I do to make this better? Whether that's in your family. What can I do to make this better? You see, I firmly believe that when you see someone working to improve the lives of those around them or others around them, that's when you are witnessing leadership. It really just begins by saying, okay, I'm going to care. I'm going to use these two wonderful things that it's at the end of my arms to do something. I'm going to let my feet take me to a place. I'm going to use my mouth. I'm going to apply my mind. But I'm going to care and be involved and get involved. Now, that doesn't mean I can change everything, but it certainly is that I can impact on something. And a whole lot of some things together becomes everything eventually. So can we be those people? What, What position are you in? Where's God placed you? If you're retired, does that mean it's done? You can't care any longer? You don't have to care? I don't think so. I think there's opportunity. Life is difficult. I know that. But I think as believers particularly, we have every reason to put our hands up. And to take leadership. Let me tell you two reasons at least why I think we have every reason as believers. And it should be almost natural for us to take leadership wherever you put us. I'm not talking about positions of leadership and authority. and I'm talking about taking care. Signing up. The first reason is we have a great vision of a better tomorrow. The scripture provides us with what a better tomorrow looks like. So our hearts are captured by a vision of a better tomorrow, of a Jesus that's returning, of of heaven being expressed on earth. We already have that. Perhaps the rest of the world is wondering and looking for what is a better tomorrow. And, And perhaps even when they find it, their framework of what a better tomorrow is is not robust and strong enough, but we have a, an amazing framework of what a better tomorrow is. And that should already stir us and capture us. But secondly, not only have we a good idea of what a better tomorrow is, we have the Holy Spirit that empowers us. 
Because I'm not talking about pull yourself up by your bootstraps and take leadership. I'm saying respond to the Holy Spirit who is within you. The same Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that worked in the life of Moses, in the, in the life of Abraham, in the life of David, in the life of Ruth, in the life of Esther, in the life of Paul the Apostle. The same Holy Spirit that empowered Jesus, that same Holy Spirit is alive within me. So even when I don't want to care, the Holy Spirit cares. Even when I just want to worry about myself, the Holy Spirit goes, no, no, I've, got, I've made you for more. So just those two things, and I think you can mention some others, should cause us as, as believers to go, okay, I'm going to assume leadership. So how do I do that? How do I exercise leadership? Let me just make three points. And these are sort of the three fundamentals of leadership. And they simply are have a vision, build on values, and execute a plan. Just those three steps. Have a vision, build on values, and execute a plan. If you want to assume leadership, if you want to take leadership in any space, these are the three things that you will find yourself having to do to, to go on that path of development. Let's talk about have a vision. Proverbs 29 verse 18 is that very well-known scripture that we so often quote in these contexts. Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Where there's no vision, the people perish. Why is that true? Why do people perish when there's no vision? Because if, there, if nobody has any idea about what tomorrow, how tomorrow can be better than today, then tomorrow is going to be worse than today. Isn't that logical? If we're not working at improving things, they will go backwards. They deteriorate. We live in a fallen, broken world. Therefore, there's natural entropy that is, exists all around us. Wherever you see something improving, know that there's somebody making it happen. It doesn't happen all by itself. Somebody has to have an idea that goes, I've got an idea about what tomorrow can look like. How tomorrow can be better than today. In a nation where we have something like 35% unemployment, we need somebody to say, I see a South Africa where we don't have such a high unemployment rate. I see a South Africa where perhaps we have a 10% unemployment rate. Perhaps even a 5% unemployment rate. Somebody has to say, it can be different. It can look different. Somebody has to stand up in a family and say, we're not going to just repeat the patterns of the past. We're going to do it differently. I've got an idea. Somebody has to say, we grew up without any resources. We had no money. But I see a, a different way for us as a family. Or somebody has to say, you know, the story of our family is that we're always fighting with one another. Nobody's talking to each other. We're in complete chaos and disarray. I see it can be different. Somebody has to say, I see a better tomorrow. That means somebody has to allow hope to arrive and arise within them. And sometimes that's difficult because sometimes we feel so beaten down. We feel so under the circumstances that we go, oh, okay. But then things will just go from bad to worse. Somebody has to have a vision. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Describe a better tomorrow for the people around you. But begin by describing it for yourself. Perhaps I can encourage you, whether you're a parent, whether you're a business owner, whether you're looking for a job, you're looking for more fulfillment in your career, whatever it is, whatever you may think, if you're looking for more finances, for, for more time, for whatever, sit down and begin to describe to yourself, what do you think the better tomorrow will look like? Because if you don't have a description, then what are you going for? I'm not, you don't even have to sit down and write a vision statement and a mission statement. Just begin to think about what is a better tomorrow and begin to describe that to yourself. What is a better tomorrow for your family? What is a better tomorrow for you personally? What is a better tomorrow for your business or for your workplace? 
What is a better tomorrow for where you find yourself tomorrow this time? Or as we often refer to it, as your front line. What's a better tomorrow? Describe it. Begin to get a sense of it. Begin to say, I think that this can happen. Begin to dream in some way. If nobody dreams, then everything just deteriorates. Thank God for the dreamers, the people that say, I think, I think something can be done. Once you've got a description of a, of, of a, of a better tomorrow, begin to share it with others. Begin to talk to others. Specifically those that are in that space. Begin, if it's your, for your family, then begin to have a conversation with your family. Like, you know, this is what we believe. Both Natasha and I came from households where our families became, were declared bankrupt while we were at school. I have very good memories of them coming to take all our stuff. And, and she can tell you her memories. And so early on when we got married and, uh, you know, preparing for ministry, and we prepared ourselves for a life where we would probably never really have a lot of money. I was earning 400 rand at the time. And uh, she had to go find a job to keep us just, you know, have something. But we sat down with, with each other and, we, and in a time of discussion and prayer, we said, Lord, our vision is that if you bless us with children, that they will never experience what we experienced. The fear and the insecurity, the, the sense of loss. They will never experience that. Now, you, have, you may have gone through something like that, but that's the past. What is your dream for tomorrow? How are you going to change that and not keep that a repetitive pattern in your life? It requires you to sit down and begin to say, and then talk about it. Get agreement. And then invite others to join you, those for whom it's appropriate. If, if it's a vision for your family, like for us, it was a vision in our terms of our family. There was many different aspects to that, but one of it was financial. We had to invite our children to join us on this journey. And we had to teach them about debt and not to have debt and how do we deal with these things. And more important than even inviting them, we had to inspire them. Simon Sinek said, there's only two ways to influence human behavior. You can manipulate or you can inspire. Manipulation is not an option for us. The Bible is very clear on that. It's like the sin of witchcraft. So we do not use fear. We do not use um, emotional blackmail. We do not get people to do things because of manipulation. So I, I can't get my kids to live a certain vision because I manipulate them. I have to inspire them. I have to invite them to join me on this journey. And then by inspiring them, it becomes their vision. And, and the, it's such a powerful thing to inspire people. And, and by the way, that's what, if you want to serve people, you serve them. One of the ways you serve them is you inspire them. Because how can you inspire people? You inspire people because you have first begun to live the vision that you want for others. You've taken the, the discipline. You've done the hard work. You begin to inspire others. Have a vision. Share it with people. Invite them to be part of it. And inspire people through your life. Your life is an inspiration because of the Holy Spirit. You don't have to walk the same path as anybody else. You don't have to make the failures that those in your family have made, you can do it differently because of the power of the Holy Spirit. So have a vision. Secondly, build on values. Micah 6 verse 8 says the following, He has shown you, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? Act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. I want to take those three things and describe them and use them as value statements. These are things that God values. He values justice. He values love and mercy. And he values humility. You see, values are very important. 
Because values are actually the things that get you to the where you want to go. If you have a vision for something, you have to learn to value something that is in line with that vision. So in our family, again, using our, our financial situation, for Natasha and myself, we had to sit down and say, what are we going to value? Because we said we're not going to make debt, you know, unreasonable debt. That became the value. So therefore, when we got married, the church rented us, we ran the year of your life we were married in September. By the January of the next year, we started running the year of your life. And so we were given a little house just here behind the church. Nice little place. Beautiful little home. But we had no furniture. But we said we're not going to make debt. And so we had nothing for a while. And we had to host a lot of people and have our leaders come and meet at our house. And we made the floor as inviting as we could. You know, and then somebody eventually gave us like a, a little box set, little box lounge suite, and it was it used to be white. It was now some other color, stained, not looking so great, and it was the most uncomfortable thing in the world. But that's the first lounge, and we were like, hey. Then somebody gave us a dining room table. Then somebody gave us a chair, and somebody else gave us a chair. And soon we had four or five chairs. None of them looked the same, but they fitted around the dining room table. And that was our journey. We never bought a piece of furniture on debt because of, we, we said, we value something because what we value is what will determine our future, what we value now. Now, I'm not saying that's how you have to live. I'm trying to just describe to you your values matter. What you value is what you spend your time, your energy, your resources on. And if you want to change your future, but you don't want to change what you value now, you're living in dreamland. Because your future will be a direct result of what you value now. And sometimes those values need adjustment, don't they? We grew up a certain way. And that had certain results. But now we don't want the results, but we want to value the same things the same way. Uh, no. What do we value? So these three things that the scripture, this scripture proposes to us to value. Value what is right. God values justice. Justice is the practice of what is right. In a manner that is equal and fair to every person. Value what is right. Every one of us, as we live our lives... We, find, we have moments and opportunities where we have to make a decision. Am I going this way or am I going that way? And sometimes the decision is, this may be the more right thing to do, but it's going to take too long. So I'm going to choose this way because it may not be so 100% right, but it will get me there quicker. It will get me there quicker. The moment you begin to do that, what you're doing is you're building a value system. You're building a value system. And your values will eventually become your automatic response to whatever decision you have to make. So sometimes it's hard work. One of the things we had to put in place, again, just with our finances, is from the word go, we said we're going to have a budget. If we're earning 400 rand a month, then that 400 rand will be budgeted. Tithe comes first. You know, and then we had to live off whatever. But that budget became our, our statement of values. It was our directing of the resources we had to that which we valued because we wanted a long-term outcome. And so we lived by that budget. Natasha used to always say she couldn't even buy a chocolate if it wasn't on the budget. Why? Because we needed a bit of a disciplined structure. So that we didn't live by what we felt, but we lived by what we knew and decided is right for us. But it takes discipline. Now today we can buy a chocolate, we don't have to have it on a budget. Perhaps we should put it back on a budget. <laughs> Amen. But you understand the point. You must learn to value what is right. We live in a nation where the saying is, ach, everybody does it. Ach, everybody does it. Ach, everybody bribes the 
traffic police. Everybody does it. If you say that, what, what are you valuing? What are you valuing? What you value becomes your lifestyle. And then you, it's fine, I suppose, if you want to do that. But then please shut up when the news shows about people that are stealing money and corruption. Because you have no right to say anything. Because you're just part of the same problem. Sorry, now. Well, shut up a bit of a hard word. It's like, but shut up. You know what I mean. It's like, you know, really. Value what is right. If it's right, it's yes. But somewhere in my life, I have to decide what is the price of my soul. And I'm not going to sell my, my life for something that is less than what God says my value is. I'm not going to do it. But we all have to determine that. So what do you believe is right? And choose that. Value that. Value people, the scripture says, and love mercy. I want to interpret that and apply that in a way of value people. Imagine how different our nation will be if we just learn to really value people. I think we'll drive differently, for sure. In South Africa, crossing the road is a dangerous exercise. You know, most people in this country killed on, on our roads are killed or pedestrians. Nah? Because in South Africa, you see somebody cross the road, it's like, hey, hey, target practice. And we make all sorts of jokes about it. But it's, it just shows that we've somewhere developed a culture that we don't even think about caring about each other on the road. I mean, the other day I was driving and I was coming around a bend and here's a guy standing in the middle of the road, hazards on, because in South Africa we think as long as your hazards are on, that means you can do whatever you want. Hazards on talking on his phone, but I'm coming around the corner. If I wasn't quick enough, I'd write in. And I was like wanting to stop and say, don't you care that you could cause somebody serious harm? We, we stop in... You know the we I'm talking about now. We stop in the middle of an intersection and offload and onload pa passengers. And I'm like, that's fine. I'm so grateful you want to care for your commuters and want to get them to the closest place of where they need to be. But can you please do it in a way that it doesn't threaten my life? It feels like we, we've lost sometimes the, just the basic ability of caring about people. It's like we, we just want to spend the least amount of energy and time to move somebody along so they become somebody else's problem. I'm talking about phoning call centers. Isn't that an exercise of feeling loved and cared for? It's when you phone a call center. Whether it's your bank, whether it's your medical aid, whether it's whoever, you phone the call center and the person answers and you say this. They say, I, they just give you some scripted answer and all you're hearing is they're saying, I just want to do the least I can so that you will not be my problem anymore. Have you encountered when you go to like an office, like an internal affairs or somebody, and you arrive with somebody, and this person says, okay, I'm going to help you. And they begin to care about you, the difference it makes. Isn't it amazing how people can solve a problem just because they care? Care about people. Have mercy for people. Whatever your position in life is, you can care for people. You can value people. You can say, by the way you treat them, the way you speak to them, the way you follow up on your promises, you're in, you can say, you matter. Imagine if we had a nation where that was just communicated by the way we treated one another. Let's value people. Let's value humility and trust. The scripture says, love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Let's begin to value humility. A gentleman by the name of Sherin Nassim wrote the following. He said, 
Being authentically humble humanizes a leader. Strengthen trust, strengthens trust and builds confidence and loyalty among others. Humility is the trait that magnifies all other positive attributes. Without humility, all of a leader's other strengths become diminished, if not invisible. You know what humility is? Humility is just, I'm not the only being and most important person on this planet. Perhaps it just begins there. Others also matter. Perhaps this world is not all about how I can get the best and the most for myself. Perhaps this world is, my life here is actually not about what is the best for me, but how do I make this a better place for the people around me? And in that, surely, I will also experience good. But it's not all about me. When I went through my trauma counseling after our, our, our robbery, one of the things the psycho psychiatrist, that, a psychologist that worked with me checked is, did I have a sense of being treated unfairly? So she asked me some questions around that. Do you feel, do you struggle with a feeling of like, why did this happen to me? And, and I reflected on it. I said, no, I don't have a feeling like that. I'm very clear that this shouldn't have happened to me or my family. This is not right. This is not appropriate. We didn't deserve it. But I don't have a strong feeling of why did it happen to me in particular. And she said that's very important because that's the point where many people get stuck. They, they feel that somehow they are above going through these struggles. It, it's, they understand it happens, but it shouldn't happen to them. And when it does, they stuck with the feeling of this is unfair. The reason I said, well, I don't think I have that because my understanding of Scripture is this is a broken world. And if this is a broken world, then bad things are going to happen to good people. And therefore, sometimes these things are going to happen. And I'm not special, different than anybody else. Therefore, if it happens to me, statistically, there's a good chance in this nation at this point in time. And by the way, we live in the, decent statistics showed we live in the area that has the fourth highest robberies last year. So statistically, it's possible that it could have happened to me. Is it right that it happened to me? Did I deserve it? No. Can I be angry that it happened to me? Yes, but I'm just anybody else. You see, we have this self-entitlement, self-focus. And again, that's the thing that deeply is challenged by the Scripture. If you want to be great, you need to be a servant of all. I can only be a servant of all because I start realizing it's not all about me. I cannot judge my life on how everything falls into place the way I want it to fall into place. Because then I'm never going to be happy. Stuff's going to happen. But in every situation, in every situation, God can use me. If I value and have humility. Humility fosters trust. As we're coming up to elections and as we're praying for our elections, let's pray for people that we can trust. Because I think that's one of the things we're all scratching our heads and going, who can I trust? And, and one of the things that helps build trust is just humility. Because humility brings with it honesty, integrity, transparency. But if they aren't doing it, it doesn't change the fact that I can do it. I can be a trustworthy, humble person with integrity. I can be trustworthy. My word can mean something. If I say it, I'm going to do it. And if I can't, I'm going to tell you I couldn't do it. And, and I will be honest with you. Makes the difference. Build on values. Then the last thing is execute a plan. You see, you can have a vision about a, a better world, and you can even begin to think about how should you live, but if you don't put one foot in front of the other and actually do something, then a better world's not gonna come. Your better tomorrow is not gonna come because you dream about it. This is, the, this is the way many South Africans think about a better tomorrow. It's a Powerball on Tuesday. <laughs> and uh, I, th I think the Powerball was like 130 million this past week or something. 
So uh, my better tomorrow is a bit, uh, I'd better get to the store and or my banking app and go buy myself a lottery ticket because that's my way to a better tomorrow. Now, praise the Lord. If you win the lottery, just make sure you tithe. Um, <laughs> And, and you know the Christian version of that is, is I'm going to pray and I'm going to ask the Lord for the willing numbers. <laughs> I'm sorry. I think you'll agree with me that's not a good enough plan. But that's how many South Africans, not just playing the lottery, they're waiting for somebody to do something. All authority has been given to me, Jesus says. I now give it to you. We, in the power of the Spirit and in the inspiration and the working of what the Scripture teaches us, we are those that need to take the steps and do the things. Scripture says, the plans, in Proverbs 21 verse 5, the plans of the diligent lead to profit. As surely as haste leads to poverty. The plans of the diligent. Two wonderful words. Planning and diligence. That means have a plan and keep doing it. Diligence. Sometimes we have a plan. We do it once. We do it twice. Ach, nee. It's a waste of time. It takes diligence. As surely as haste leads to poverty. Haste leads to poverty. Sometimes we have people that are struggling in poverty, not because of some systemic problem, those are real, those are there, or because of you know, injustice, those are real. Sometimes we have people that struggle just because they're too hasty. They don't want to do the hard work of the building blocks to create the wealth in what context of their life. I have no interest of being the wealthiest person in the world. I am interested in being a person that has wealth. But wealth according to what God has planned for my life and for me and my family and how we will impact and make a difference in this world. And that comes by discipline and the grace and the favor of the Lord. But it takes time. Take responsibility. If you want to execute a plan, take responsibility. Say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to own this, this dream of a better tomorrow. I'm actually going to do something about it. I'm going to own it. I'm going to take responsibility. Then secondly, take advice. There's always somebody that is two steps further than you. So if you have a dream for your family, I promise you there's somebody that's walked a similar journey with their family and they can give you good advice. Take advice. Ask. Take responsibility. Take advice. Take action. Do it. Sometimes we get caught and we think until I have the perfect plan that I know will perfectly solve my problem and produce it better tomorrow, I can't do anything. I love that saying that says a clear, good plan today is better than a perfect plan tomorrow. Because otherwise we keep on waiting someday, someday. I'm gonna, my ship's going to come in someday. It's all going to come together and then I'm going to do it. No, what is Today. What is the action today? The small step today. Perhaps I can't do today the thing that will ultimately serve, solve the problem that I see down the road, but I can take the first step towards. Because if I take the right step today, I can take the right step tomorrow. And then take correction. As, you, as you're taking action, be very open to correction. Learning. You try something, then you go, oh, that didn't work. At least now I know how not to do it. And get others to speak in. That's what community helps. So, do you want to be a person that can see a better tomorrow? A better tomorrow for our nation? A better tomorrow for yourself? A better tomorrow for your family? A better tomorrow for your workplace? A better tomorrow for your neighborhood? Then just begin to care. And then begin to think about how can it be better? Then what values do we need to begin to foster and build and put in place 
so that we can have this better picture that I have? And then what steps do I need to take? What steps do I need to take? It's not, it's not very complicated. And sometimes it's such small things that we think it's not big enough. But we walk that journey. If you're here today and something is stirring in your heart and you're saying, okay, and you know the context, you know your, the better tomorrow that you would want to sign up for or that perhaps you've signed up for already that you're engaging in. Then I'm going to ask right now, if you're saying, that's me, I'm, I'm taking leadership. Perhaps I have taken leadership, but I'm, I'm renewing that decision. I'm taking it still. Or perhaps you're saying, I've not taken leadership, but I want to take leadership. Or I recognize that I've let things go and I, 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 I want to stand. Then I'm going to invite you to stand with me and I want to pray a prayer. I want to pray for our nation. And then I want to pray for us as individuals. Ruzan, where's Ruzan? Come play with me, Ruzan, thank you. Play for me or whatever. Now, if I can encourage you in this moment, I think it's, it's generally useful that when we pray a prayer like this, not to have some nebulous, undescribed thought, but to bring something concrete to the Lord. Say, so this is, my, this is the, the better tomorrow that I see. It, it, that may not be everything in your life, but the, the one thing right now. Can you do that? Just get hold of something in your thoughts. Lord, I thank you for every wonderful and beautiful person created on purpose, with a purpose, created in your image, entrusted with your spirit, given authority. Here in this room, those online, those on the radio with us, you know their context, you know the situations they are in. You know where you've placed them. You know what is working against them what is trying to undermine them, what is causing them to be exhausted, what is causing them to feel hopeless or to feel like, I can't do this. You know, Holy Spirit, because you know every person. But I pray in this moment right now, in Jesus' name, as they're standing in your presence saying, Lord, I wanna, I wanna exercise leadership. We do so with full humility, knowing, Lord, that we can't change the world, but we can be your vessels. We can be used by you. And so I pray for that right now for every person standing and those in the online space. And I, I trust you, Lord, right now in Jesus' name. I take authority over the schemes of the evil one, over the lies, over the deception, over the diversions of the enemy, over his belittling tactics in your life over his condemnation. I, I take authority over those things, Lord, and I pray that those lies will be broken today in this place in Jesus' name. I thank you, Father, that those, those things that are taking us to the places which is not your will for us will be revealed, will be shown for what they are, and that we would choose differently in Jesus' name. And then I pray, Lord, for strength to arise right now. Not, not your own strength, not my strength, not my human strength merely, but the strength of the Spirit of the Lord. The resurrection power of Christ right now to arise within us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Give us a revelation of a better tomorrow, Lord. Show us the better tomorrow that you have us in line for and what you want us to work on. Not just a better tomorrow for me, but for those around me and those that you've called me to serve, Lord. Show me the better tomorrow. And then work in my life, realign my value system, Lord. So that I will treat my resources, my time, my energy, other people, to be, that the way I deal with them will be in line with your value system. And then give me plans that are executable that I can do, Lord. 
Come, Holy Spirit, right now, we pray. Just thank you for your working in our midst. And then, Lord, we turn our eyes to our nation. And we thank you, Lord, that this nation is a nation for which you have purposes. I thank you for your plans for our nation. And that you have not left us, Lord. You've not given up on us. And we call upon the name of the Lord. And we say, come, Holy Spirit. We trust you that in this year that you will do something remarkable. And we trust you, Lord, that you will work in our nation for a better tomorrow in Jesus' name. Not just a better tomorrow as we would think, Lord. Not by our standards, but let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Let your truth, let your righteousness, let your justice be established in a new way in this nation in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, that through these elections, that you will work in ways that, that will call us, cause us all to go. We did not expect that to happen. Because man can plan, but God will have his way. And we trust you for that. But we're not saying that, Lord, without each of us being prepared to take responsibility and to be the ones used by you. We will change the spirit of this nation. The spirit of corruption will stop at my door. It will not go further than that, Lord, in Jesus' name. The spirit of hatred will not find me cooperating with it in Jesus' name. A, a spirit of, of falsehood, of pride, it will not find me in support of it, Lord. And I thank you for that, not because of me, Lord, but because of your grace. And so we lift up the name of Jesus in this place. Can I ask you just to raise your hands and just lift up the name of Jesus? He is the name above every other name. He is the only hope we have. And so we lift you up, Jesus. We exalt you. Come and have your way. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. And we all together say, Amen and Amen and Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I want to remind you, if you want to meet with Ben in our Connect Lounge, please do so. But we will also have our team here in the front ready to pray for people. It's really our privilege. Week after week, we pray for people and we hear the stories of your life and we, and we, and we see the challenges. But, and, and it's a privilege to pray with you and trust with you for God's coming through in your life. It may also be that you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus. Come to the front, pray with somebody and tell them, I want to give my life to Jesus and they'll help you with that. Thank you for joining us on the live stream and on radio and thank you for being with us and have a wonderful, wonderful week. See you again. Thank you for being with us today, family. If you have any prayer needs, send an email to prayforme at hatfield.co.za and our ministry team will gladly serve you. To be connected to our community or to find out more, send an email to hello at hatfield.co.za or simply visit our website homepage and scroll down to the Happening at Hatfield section. Goodbye.